It was a chilly autumn night about three years ago when I found myself cruising down Interstate 80 in Nebraska. I was on my way to Lincoln for a job interview, feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness about the opportunity ahead. The clock on my dashboard read 11.47 p.m., and the highway stretched out before me, dark and nearly empty. I'd started my journey from Cheyenne, Wyoming, earlier that day, figuring I'd make it to Lincoln in one long haul. The drive had been uneventful so far, with nothing but the hum of my car's engine and the occasional country song on the radio to keep me company. The flat Nebraska landscape rolled by in the darkness, broken only by the occasional glimmer of distant farmhouse lights. As I passed the exit for North Platte, I noticed my eyelids getting heavy. I decided to stop at the next rest area for a quick power nap and some coffee. However, fate had other plans for me that night. About twenty miles east of North Platte, I noticed headlights in my rearview mirror. At first, I didn't think much of it. After all, I wasn't the only night owl on the road. But as the minutes ticked by, I realized the car behind me was getting closer. Way too close for comfort. I tapped my brakes lightly, hoping the driver would take the hint and back off. Instead, the car swerved into the left lane and accelerated, pulling up alongside me. My heart rate spiked as I gripped the steering wheel tighter, unsure of what was happening. Glancing to my left, I saw a beat-up sedan, probably from the early 2000s. The interior light was on, illuminating two figures inside. The driver was a middle-aged woman with disheveled hair, her face a mask of panic as she focused on the road ahead. But it was the passenger who caught my attention and sent a chill down my spine. A young man, probably in his early twenties, was pressed against the passenger window. In his hands, he held a makeshift sign a piece of cardboard with three words scrawled in what looked like black marker. Help us. Time seemed to slow down as I processed what I was seeing. My mind raced through possible scenarios. Were they being kidnapped? Was this some kind of prank? Should I pull over and try to help? Before I could make a decision, the car suddenly accelerated, speeding past me and disappearing into the night. I sat there, stunned, watching their taillights grow smaller in the distance. It took me a few moments to snap out of my shock. I realized I needed to do something, anything. With shaking hands, I reached for my phone and dialed 911. The dispatcher answered promptly, and I did my best to explain the situation calmly. The dispatcher asked me to stay on the line and follow the car if I could do so safely. I agreed, pressing down on the accelerator to catch up. My headlights cut through the darkness as I scanned the road ahead, looking for any sign of the sedan. After a few minutes of driving at higher speeds, I spotted their taillights in the distance. I relayed this information to the dispatcher, who assured me that state troopers were being alerted and were on their way. As I followed the car, my mind conjured up all sorts of scenarios. Were they running from something? Was someone in the car being held against their will? The possibilities were endless, and each one seemed more terrifying than the last. Suddenly, the sedan's brake lights flashed, and it veered sharply onto an exit ramp. I quickly told the dispatcher which exit they were taking. It was for the small town of Gothenburg. The dispatcher advised me not to follow them off the highway, as it could be dangerous. Instead, they asked me to pull over at the exit and wait for the state troopers to arrive. I did as instructed, my heart pounding in my chest as I watched the sedan's taillights disappear down the dark country road. The dispatcher stayed on the line with me, asking for more details about what I had seen. I described the car, the people inside, and the sign as best I could remember. As I sat there waiting, my mind was racing. What if they needed immediate help? What if by staying here, I was letting them down? But I knew I had to trust the dispatcher's advice. 
I wasn't equipped to handle whatever situation was unfolding and I could be putting myself in danger if I tried to intervene. The minutes ticked by slowly, each one feeling like an eternity. I kept my eyes fixed on the road where the sedan had disappeared, half expecting or maybe hoping to see it reappear. But the road remained empty and dark. Finally, after what felt like hours, but was probably only about 15 minutes, I saw the flashing lights of a state trooper's car approaching. The dispatcher told me to stay put and that the trooper would want to speak with me. The trooper pulled up behind me, and I watched in my rearview mirror as he approached my car. He asked me to step out and recount everything I had seen. I told him about the car tailing me, the woman driving, the young man with the sign, and how they had exited the highway. The trooper took detailed notes and radioed the information to other units in the area. He explained that they would search the surrounding areas and alert local law enforcement to be on the lookout for the vehicle. As we stood there on the side of the highway, another trooper car pulled up. The two officers conferred briefly. Then one of them approached me again. He asked if I would be willing to show them exactly where the car had exited. I agreed without hesitation, eager to do anything that might help. I followed the trooper's car down the exit ramp, my headlights illuminating the unfamiliar rural road. We drove slowly, all of us scanning the area for any sign of the sedan. The road wound through farmland with occasional clusters of trees breaking up the flat landscape. After a few miles, we came to a fork in the road. I told the troopers I wasn't sure which way the sedan had gone from here. They decided to split up with one car going down each road. They asked me to wait at the fork in case I remembered any other details that might help. As I sat there alone in the dark, the reality of the situation began to sink in. What had started as a routine drive had turned into something out of a crime thriller. I found myself jumping at every sound, every shadow cast by my headlights. About twenty minutes later, both trooper cars return. They hadn't found any sign of the sedan. One of the officers approached my car again, asking if I was absolutely certain about what I had seen. There was a hint of skepticism in his voice that made me bristle. I reaffirmed everything I had told them, describing the car, the woman, and the young man in as much detail as I could remember. I emphasized the look of fear on the woman's face, the desperation in the young man's eyes as he held up that makeshift sign. The troopers conferred again, then came back to me. They explained that they would continue searching the area and put out an alert to all nearby jurisdictions. They took my contact information and told me they would be in touch if they needed any more information. As I prepared to leave, one of the troopers advised me to be careful. He said that while they took all reports seriously, sometimes things weren't always as they seemed. He suggested that I continue to my destination and try not to dwell on the incident too much. His words left me feeling unsettled. Part of me wanted to argue, to insist that what I had seen was real and serious. But I was exhausted, both physically and emotionally, and I knew there was nothing more I could do here. I merged back onto I-80, my mind reeling from the events of the night. The adrenaline was still pumping through my veins, making it impossible to feel tired anymore. I kept replaying the scene in my head, wondering if I had done enough, if I could have done more. Over breakfast, I checked local news websites, hoping to find some information about what had happened. But there was nothing. No reports of a kidnapping, no mention of a car chase, nothing that seemed related to what I had witnessed. I called the Nebraska State Patrol later that morning, asking if there were any updates on the case. The officer I spoke to was polite, but couldn't give me any information, explaining that the investigation was ongoing. Over the next few weeks, I called the Nebraska State Patrol regularly for updates.
Each time I was told that the investigation was ongoing but that they had no new information to share. I began to feel frustrated and helpless, wondering if anything was really being done to find those people. Now, three years later, I still think about that night whenever I'm driving on a dark, lonely highway. It was about four years ago when I had one of the most unsettling experiences of my life as a long-haul trucker. I'd been driving for nearly a decade at that point, crisscrossing the country more times than I could count. I thought I'd seen it all. But that night on Highway 50 in Nevada proved me wrong. I was hauling a load of electronics from Sacramento, California to Denver, Colorado. It was a route I'd done before. But this time I decided to take the scenic route through Nevada on Highway 50, also known as the loneliest road in America. The name isn't just for show. It's a stretch of highway that runs through some of the most desolate parts of the state, with miles and miles of nothing but desert and mountains. I'd left Sacramento in the early afternoon, figuring I'd make it to Ely, Nevada, before calling it a night. The drive started off pretty uneventful. The scenery was beautiful in its own stark way. Endless stretches of sagebrush, distant mountains, and a sky so big it made you feel small. As the sun started to set, painting the desert in shades of orange and purple, I found myself enjoying the solitude. It was just me, my rig, and the open road. The radio was playing some old country tunes and I was tapping my fingers on the steering wheel, feeling pretty good about life. But as darkness fell, the atmosphere changed. The vastness that had felt liberating during the day now felt oppressive. The headlights of my truck carved a tunnel through the inky blackness, and the moments when another vehicle passed became fewer and farther between. I'd been driving for about six hours when I noticed my fuel gauge was getting low. I hadn't seen a gas station in a while and I started to feel a bit anxious. Running out of gas out here would be more than just an inconvenience. It could be dangerous. Just when I was starting to really worry, I saw a sign for a gas station coming up in a few miles. I breathed a sigh of relief, but as I got closer, that relief turned to unease. The gas station appeared out of the darkness like something from another time. It was a small, dilapidated building with two ancient-looking pumps out front. A flickering neon sign proclaimed it open, but the place looked like it had seen better days, maybe better decades. I pulled up to the pump, the gravel crunching under my tires. The place was eerily quiet with no other vehicles in sight. I sat in my truck for a moment, debating whether to try my luck and see if I could make it to the next town. But a quick check of my GPS showed the next gas station was over 100 miles away. I didn't have much choice. As I climbed down from the cab, the cold desert air hit me like a slap in the face. I shivered, suddenly wishing I'd grabbed my jacket. The pump looked like something out of a museum, but to my surprise, it accepted my credit card without issue. As I stood there, watching the numbers on the pump slowly tick up, I got the distinct feeling I was being watched. I glanced towards the station's small convenience store and saw a figure standing behind the counter, visible through the grimy window. It was an old man, rail-thin with wispy white hair. He was just standing there, staring at me. Not moving, not doing anything, just staring. I tried to shake off the creepy feeling and focused on filling up my tank. Once the tank was full, I knew I'd have to go inside to get a receipt. I took a deep breath and walked towards the store, the gravel crunching loudly under my boots in the still night air. The bell over the door gave a weak jingle as I entered. The interior was as run down as the outside, with flickering fluorescent lights illuminating dusty shelves stocked with expired snacks and faded magazines. The smell of stale cigarette smoke hung in the air. The old man behind the counter hadn't moved. 
He was even older up close, his face a mass of wrinkles, his eyes sunken but startlingly alert. He didn't say a word as I approached, just kept staring at me with an intensity that made my skin crawl. I cleared my throat and asked for a receipt. The old man didn't respond verbally, just slowly turned to the ancient cash register and started punching buttons. The machine wheezed and clattered, eventually spitting out a faded receipt. As he handed me the receipt, his gnarled fingers brushed against mine, and I had to suppress a shudder. His hand was ice cold. I muttered a thank you and turned to leave, eager to get back on the road and put this place behind me. I was almost at the door when I heard his voice. It was raspy and dry, like sandpaper on wood. He told me I should have kept driving. I froze, my hand on the door handle. I turned back slowly, but the old man was just staring at me, his face impassive. I asked him what he meant, but he didn't respond. He just kept staring, his eyes boring into me. The fluorescent lights flickered, and for a moment I could have sworn his eyes looked completely black. I blinked, and they were normal again. My heart was pounding as I pushed open the door and practically ran back to my truck. As I climbed into the cab, I glanced back at the store. The old man was still there, still staring. I started the engine and pulled out of the gas station as quickly as I could without seeming suspicious. As I accelerated back onto the highway, I checked my mirrors. The gas station quickly disappeared into the darkness behind me. I'd been driving for about ten minutes, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly my knuckles were white, when I saw something that made my blood run cold. There was a car parked just off the highway, its lights off. As I passed, I could have sworn I saw movement, like someone ducking down to avoid being seen. My mind raced back to the old man's words. Should have kept driving. Was this what he meant? Was someone waiting out here, looking for victims? The lonely stretch of highway suddenly felt a lot more sinister. I pressed down on the accelerator, pushing my rig to go faster than was probably safe on the winding desert road. Every shadow seemed to hide a threat, every curve in the road a potential ambush point. For the next hour, I drove like a man possessed, barely blinking, my eyes constantly darting to my mirrors. But nothing happened. No car appeared behind me. No one tried to run me off the road. Slowly, very slowly, I started to relax. By the time I reached Eli, I was exhausted both physically and emotionally. I pulled into the first motel I saw, a cheap place on the outskirts of town. As I checked in, the bored-looking clerk asked if I was okay, mentioning that I looked like I'd seen a ghost. I woke up early the next morning, the events of the previous night feeling almost like a bad dream in the harsh light of day. But the receipt from the gas station on my bedside table was a tangible reminder that it had all been real. As I sat in a local diner, nursing a cup of coffee and picking at a plate of eggs, I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened. Had I really been in danger, or had my imagination run wild in the lonely desert night? Was the old man trying to warn me, or was he just a senile old-timer getting his kicks by scaring travelers? I decided to ask my waitress if she knew anything about the gas station. She looked at me strangely when I described it, telling me there hadn't been a gas station at that location for at least twenty years. The last one out there had burned down in the late nineties, and no one had ever rebuilt. A chill ran down my spine at her words. I pulled out the receipt from my pocket, but to my shock the paper was blank. The waitress must have noticed my distress because she asked if I was feeling all right. I mumbled something about lack of sleep and quickly paid my bill. Back in my truck I sat for a long time, trying to make sense of what had happened. Had I imagined the whole thing? But no. My fuel gauge showed I had a full tank, and I knew I'd been running on fumes the night before. I thought about reporting the incident to the local police 
but decided against it. What would I tell them? That I'd gotten gas at a station that didn't exist? That an old man had cryptically warned me about? Something? That I'd seen a suspicious car on a lonely highway? None of it was illegal, and I'd sound crazy. For the rest of the trip, I stuck to major roads and well-lit truck stops. I found myself jumping at shadows and eyeing fellow travelers with suspicion. It took weeks before I started to feel normal again, before I could drive at night without constantly checking my mirrors. It was about five years ago when I had one of the scariest experiences of my life as a delivery driver. I'd been working for a major shipping company for a few years at that point, mostly doing daytime routes in the suburbs of Detroit. The job was pretty straightforward. Pick up packages from the warehouse, deliver them to homes and businesses, rinse and repeat. But that night, everything changed. It was late October and the days were getting shorter. The company had been pushing us to take on more night deliveries to keep up with the increasing demand from online shoppers. I wasn't thrilled about it, but the overtime pay was hard to resist, especially with the holidays coming up. That particular night, I'd been assigned a route in one of the rougher parts of Detroit. I'd heard stories from other drivers about sketchy deliveries in that area, but I'd always brush them off as exaggerations. After all, I'd grown up in the city and thought I knew how to handle myself. Looking back, I realize how naive I was. My shift started at 6 p.m., and for the first few hours, everything went smoothly. I made my way through the list of deliveries, dropping off packages at apartment buildings and small businesses. As the night wore on, the streets got quieter, and the neighborhood started to look more run down. Around 11 p.m., I pulled up to my second-to-last delivery of the night. The address was on a street I'd never heard of before, in an area that seemed to be mostly abandoned warehouses and boarded-up houses. The streetlights were few and far between, many of them broken, leaving large patches of darkness. I double-checked the address on my handheld device, hoping I'd made a mistake. But no. This was the place. It was an old brick building, probably an apartment complex at some point. But now it looked like it had been abandoned for years. Most of the windows were broken or boarded up and graffiti covered the walls. As I sat in my truck, engine idling, I debated what to do. Company policy was clear. We were supposed to attempt every delivery unless there was a clear safety risk but something about this place set off alarm bells in my head. The street was deserted, no cars parked anywhere, no signs of life, just darkness and silence. I took a deep breath and decided to make it quick. I'd drop off the package, snap a photo for proof of delivery, and get out of there. I grabbed the small box from the back of the truck and approached the building's entrance. The front door was slightly ajar, hanging crookedly on its hinges. I pushed it open, wincing at the loud creak it made. The interior was pitch black, and the smell of mold and decay hit me like a wall. I fumbled for my flashlight, its beam cutting through the darkness to reveal a debris-strewn hallway. I called out, announcing myself as a delivery driver, but my voice just echoed off the empty walls. No response. I was about to leave the package just inside the door when I heard a noise from deeper inside the building. It sounded like footsteps, slow and deliberate. My heart started racing. I called out again, louder this time, but still no response. The footsteps seemed to be getting closer. That's when I made the decision to abort the delivery. Safety first, I thought to myself as I quickly backed out of the building. As I turned to head back to my truck, my blood ran cold. In the dim light from a distant street lamp, I could see a group of men walking towards me from down the block. There were five or six of them moving with purpose, spreading out to block the street. I picked up my pace, trying not to run, 
but moving as quickly as I could without seeming panicked. But they must have sensed my fear, because they started moving faster too. I could hear their footsteps on the cracked sidewalk, getting louder and closer. I reached my truck and fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking so badly I could barely get them into the lock. Just as I heard one of the men shout at me to stop, I managed to yank the door open and throw myself inside. I slammed the door shut and locked it just as the first man reached the truck. He started pounding on the window, yelling at me to get out. I could see now that he was young, probably in his early twenties with a wild look in his eyes that terrified me. The others quickly surrounded the truck, some trying the doors, others pounding on the sides and hood. I turned the key in the ignition, praying that the engine would start. For a heart-stopping moment, it just sputtered, but then it roared to life. I threw the truck into drive and floored the accelerator. The men jumped back as I lurched forward, tires squealing on the pavement. I clipped one of them with my side mirror as I sped past, but I didn't stop to see if he was okay. All I could think about was getting out of there. I drove like a madman, taking turns at speeds that made the truck lean dangerously, blowing through stop signs and praying that there were no cops around to pull me over. It wasn't until I was back on a main road surrounded by the comforting glow of streetlights and other traffic that I finally started to relax. My hands were shaking so badly I had to pull over. I sat there for a while, engine idling, trying to calm my racing heart. As the adrenaline wore off, I started to process what had just happened. I'd come face to face with real danger, the kind of situation I'd always heard about but never truly believed would happen to me. Once I felt steady enough to drive, I headed straight back to the warehouse. I knew I'd catch hell for not completing the delivery, but at that moment, I didn't care. All I wanted was to be somewhere safe and well-lit, surrounded by people I knew. When I got back to the warehouse, my supervisor was still there, working late. He took one look at my face and knew something was wrong. I spilled the whole story, my words tumbling out in a rush. To his credit, he listened without interrupting, his face growing more concerned with each detail. When I finished, he told me I'd done the right thing by leaving. He said he'd report the incident to the police and mark that address as unsafe for future deliveries. He also offered to let me take the next day off if I needed it, which I gratefully accepted. That night, I barely slept. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those men surrounding my truck, heard the sound of their fists pounding on the windows. I kept imagining what might have happened if I hadn't gotten away. The next day, I went to the local police station to file a report. The officer who took my statement was sympathetic, but not particularly optimistic. He explained that without more specific information or evidence of a crime, there wasn't much they could do. He advised me to be more careful in the future and to trust my instincts if a situation felt dangerous. Over the next few weeks, I found myself jumping at shadows, constantly looking over my shoulder. I was jumpy and irritable, snapping at my co-workers over little things. I started having nightmares about being chased, waking up in a cold sweat night after night. My supervisor noticed the change in my behavior and suggested I talk to someone. At first I resisted the idea, thinking I could tough it out on my own. But as the weeks went by and I wasn't feeling any better, I finally agreed to see a counselor. The counselor helped me work through my feelings about the incident. She explained that I was experiencing a normal reaction to a traumatic event and gave me some techniques for managing my anxiety. Slowly but surely, I started to feel more like myself again. As I processed what had happened, I began to reflect on the broader issues at play. 
The neighborhood where the incident occurred was one of the many areas in Detroit that had been left behind by economic changes and urban decay. Poverty, lack of opportunities, and desperation had created an environment where crime seemed like a viable option for some people. I thought about the young men who had tried to attack me. What circumstances had led them to that point? What would have happened if they had succeeded in robbing me? Would it have made any real difference in their lives, or just perpetuated a cycle of violence and poverty? These questions led me to start researching more about the issues facing Detroit and other urban areas. I learned about the complex factors contributing to urban decay, from deindustrialization to systemic racism to failed urban planning policies. It opened my eyes to problems I had been aware of but had never truly understood. As I continued to work as a delivery driver, I found myself looking at the city with new eyes. I noticed things I'd overlooked before. The stark contrasts between different neighborhoods, the visible signs of economic struggle, the resilience of communities fighting to improve their circumstances. My experience also made me more cautious and aware of my surroundings. I started taking extra precautions on my routes like calling ahead to confirm deliveries in unfamiliar areas, trusting my instincts when a situation felt off, and always making sure I had a clear exit route. The company implemented some changes, too. They started providing us with more detailed information about our delivery areas, including known safety concerns. They also improved our communication systems, making it easier for us to report problems and get help if needed. As time went on, the fear from that night began to fade, replaced by a determination to be more prepared and more aware. I still did night deliveries, but I approached them with a new level of caution and respect for the potential dangers. Thank you for watching. If you found these stories gripping, don't forget to subscribe for more spine-tingling content. For another hair-raising tale, check out our suggested video. And if you're hungry for more eerie encounters, dive into our playlist featuring similar chilling narratives.